Now, I told you we had one of the best uh, executive uh, coaches in, in the business to help us here. So we've got Annie Rogers, who is an executive coach and partner at the Leadership Forum. And she is the UK leading career uh, coaching organisation. She's got over 25 years experience. Yes, that's 25 years. Uh, so she's definitely in a position to help you. As an experience, as an executive in the media and advertising industry, she's worked for CNBC, Dow Jones and Discovery Channel. And Annie works with individuals and teams of people whose ambition is to develop a robust strategic approach to make change happen. I love that expression, making change happen on a personal level, team level, and at an organizational level. And she helps and she encourages you to have that deep reflection, find that clarity of purpose, as well as transformational tools for her client's success. Now, Annie's going to be joined by Fiona Kerr from Ruffa, which are our leading sponsors today, on that really interesting and I think multidimensional topic of know your worth. And what we know is it's never been more important to be financially literate, because what we know is if you get those foundations right, then you can feel secure, not just for yourself, but for your family. So please join me in welcoming Annie and Fiona. Well, welcome everyone. In true Really Helpful Club style, we are starting the day by diving in at the deep end, grasping the nettle and the thorny issue of money. Because I think it's fair to say we don't talk enough about money. Um, whether that is a cultural bias, a gender bias, as Sarah has mentioned, it's fair to say, and there's an acknowledgement that we need to increase uh, financial literacy amongst women. But it's much more than that. It's about improving our ability as women to have agency in the conversation and having confidence in that conversation, no matter our knowledge base or our stake in the game. So I encourage you to shift your mindset slightly during this chat with Fiona, who is the specialist in this area, and consider your relationship with money, and specifically your ability and your stake in planning your financial future. So are you in a position of control, empowerment, emboldened with clarity of thought and vision on that plan? Do you cede control, avoid, tiptoe around the edges, hope for the best, or are you somewhere in the middle? Because the essay question, as it were, here today for consideration is that our relationship with money has a direct correlation with our relationship with ourselves and our own sense of worth, worth at its deepest level. So I encourage you to shift in that mindset and think it's not a one-to-one -one of, of a how-to or what for, but it's what does it mean for you? How does your relationship with money make you feel about yourself? And how does that impact your own sense of worth? So with that intro, I'm delighted to be joined by Fiona, who is a specialist. But again, I want Fiona to take off her rougher hat first in my first question, because there's no better place than to start talking about your personal experience with what financial empowerment means and your journey. But I know Fiona wants to start first with a quick question of the room. So over to you, Fiona. Thank you, Annie. And yes, spoiler alert, I also want to ask a question of you. We've done some hand raising already, so I know that we are, we're good at this. Um, but I, I, I don't have any uh, preference as to how many hands are raised. So on this one, you can entirely make up your own minds. So I want you, if you wouldn't mind, to raise your hand if you currently take the lead on investment and financial planning decisions for your household. Great. Okay, good, thank you. That's, it's helpful for me to get a gauge of the room. Um, I hope in, uh, maybe if we do this conference in a year's time or a couple more years time that more hands, if not all hands, will be raised. So I think starting from personal experiences, yeah. as, as Annie has said, um, I will use an example of my mother, which I feel more confident doing because she's not in the room. Um, <laughs> she's safely up in Scotland, but I'm sure she wouldn't, she wouldn't mind. So I grew up in a household where my mum was a career lady and was actually the higher earner of 
my parents, my two parents. Um, and despite that, she was never hugely involved um, in terms of the finances, whether that's thinking about cash flow and, and you know what we're doing with holidays or whether it was you know actually investing and thinking about the future and pensions and such like. And I'd always assumed that that was because that wasn't where her interests lie. She's you know a hugely uh, well, she's, I think, she's an amazing lady, you know, she has a lot of pursuits, uh, she's musical, but she's a doctor, and, you know, so I thought, well, not everyone's not into everything, there's no expectation that, you know, everyone should be excited about investing, um, but what I've come to realise through my adult life, as I've become a fund manager and worked in financial services myself, through discussions with her, is that she's actually hugely interested and engaged. And I'm often surprised that she can quote the level of the FTSE to me. Um, because she is taking in you know, news and she appreciates that it is impactful to the standard of her living over time. And, and that really got me thinking about, well, if she is able to you know, have these conversations with me, not in a um, you know, client investor type setting, but in a two minds having an interesting discussion about what, what do we think about politics and how does that impact markets or, you know, whatever it is. Um, it got me wondering, well, why is she going, why is she not going to the meetings with the IFA or why is she not um, really putting forward her views around risk and reward and what she wants from, from the money that they collectively have for their retirement? Um, and so, the, as I say, it got me thinking and talks exactly to what Annie has been saying at the start, that it belies, I think, her lack of involvement or proactivity in those discussions belies her lack of confidence in feeling that she has a right to be in that room and to be asking the questions that she has and to be listened to in the same way that my, my dad might feel he is in those interactions. Um, and if I may just very briefly pop my rougher hat back on only for a second, I would say that that is also the experience I have had through working in financial services, that predominantly when we're having client interactions, either it's only the man that's in the room or it's the man that's speaking if the, if the female even is there. Um, and that's not something that we want to per perpetuate mm -hmm. and we certainly don't want to reinforce it in how we interact with people. And so it speaks to me of kind of two problems. You, we've touched on them around there is a financial literacy gap. It doesn't matter what study you look at or which country you look at. It exists. There's a gender investing gap. Men are much more likely to be proactive and put their pennies into the stock market or whatever it might be. Um, but that's not, that's not an excuse for the industry as a whole to kind of take a step back and say, well, women aren't interested, so mm. we, don't, we don't need to bother with you. That's absolutely not the way that it should be. Um, so I think it's, we can have, there's efforts to be made on both sides. Some of them are probably beyond what we can achieve this morning in terms of how do you deal with the societal pressure or um, influence that women feel that they shouldn't be proactive in finances. But from my perspective, I feel very strongly that I want to break down that perception of finances being male dominated, egotistical, full of jargon and very unwelcoming to people that don't know lots about investments because that's absolutely not the case. Perfect. Thanks for that, Fiona. And I'm delighted to hear about your mum. I'd love to meet her, actually. Sounds fascinating. She's fabulous. <laughs> so you described, and in our little intro call that we had last week, you painted a picture of the average day at Ruffer, which is pretty much male dominated. So even when the partner is representing the kind of the interests or the stakes of a couple or a partnership, they are driving the conversation, the decision making, the design. So if I were to be really brutal, I'd go, well, surely one person on the other side of the table is easier, clean, brief, easier to discuss with. So what are the benefits of having another opinion? the wife, the partner, and what are the consequences of that not being the case? I mean, so many. Where to start? I think, um, firstly, there's, there's a very practical reason why it's worthwhile that you might, sh you should be involved. Um, and it's not very cheery for a, for a kind of Thursday morning, but you know, if, if you are in a partnership, that's a kind of assumption that we're making for this <laughs> conversation, although it might not be true across the board. But if you are, that might not always be the case for one reason mm. or another. And 
you know, what you don't want to be dealing with in a situation where maybe you are having to take the lead due to ill health or a change in relationship or, God forbid, someone isn't with you anymore. You, know, you don't want to be dealing with a brand new relationship and starting from scratch and no idea which way is up on top of dealing with, with mm -hmm. everything else that's going on. So that's a very kind of mundane, practical example as to why I think it's very useful to be involved and aware. Um, but more aligned with what we're talking about today is, why shouldn't you be? It's your money too, it's your future. So why should you care any less about what happens to it? And why should you be any less involved than, than your partner or whomever it is? So on that note, if I've taken a back step then, if I haven't been naturally or normally part of that process, what advice would you have for me in terms of where would I, where might I start? Notwithstanding a conversation with the person that's already leading that yes. conversation, but what would your advice be? Well, I think the first thing I would say before I give any advice is to reassure people that you do not need to know about investments yeah. to speak to your investment manager or your financial planner. Um, I think that's f for women more so than men. That is seen as a kind of bar that you have to clear and it's, it's a, it's a put off. You don't want to sound stupid or you, you think you might make things worse by asking difficult questions. That is categorically not true. I would remind you all that it is a financial services industry and we are all paid to service you. So there are no stupid questions. And from a personal perspective, I would very much welcome engagement from my clients. Um, so there's no kind of detrimental impact to you becoming involved in terms of muddying the message or, or any of that. In terms of practical advice, I appreciate that despite what I've just said, it can be daunting if you haven't thought about numbers since, you know, standard grade maths. So I appreciate that. And I think the best fitting for you is to start with you, yourself. Make it about you. As I said, financial services industry, our job is to ensure that we can deliver on your financial goals. And nobody is better placed than you to decide what your financial goals are. So a starting point, I would say, from scratch is do a bit of a recce. How much do you spend and how much do you earn or do you have to live off? Have an idea of where you are in that balance. That's really helpful information from a starting point. So financial position. And then secondly, you know, what do you want to achieve over the longer term? It's not for me or any other fund manager to tell you that. So I think start on solid ground of where you're coming from and what you want to achieve. Can I just ask on that financial goal setting? Because it obviously it's highly personal and looks like very different things to different people. So whether it's, you know, retiring to Cornwall or buying a yacht in Monaco or indeed saving up for the next kind of limited edition, whatever it is, might be art, it might be a bag, whatever. What are the ingredients, the vital ingredients that you think people should consider when they are looking at financial goals? And how often do they change? Mm. So we could write an essay on that, um, but it is a very important question. I think at a high level to start with, understanding or, or expressing out loud what your values are around money. And this is actually the easiest step, I think. I think if any of us take a moment to think about it, you will know your values about money. And I do kind of give some examples. Are you one of those people that believes you can't take it with you? So you know, enjoy your life, live life to the full. You're not saving, yeah. My parents call this skiing, spending the kids' inheritance, that's what they call it. So are you a skier? Or are you somebody who has a very strong feeling about wanting to pass on a legacy, either to generations below or say to a charity? Or are you, you know, very, very cautious and you always want to have something in reserve because maybe you have a risky career that, you know, the earnings are not stable and you want some certainty in your life from somewhere else. So I think that those sort of very values-focused discussions are a great starting point because I think you'll very quickly find mm -hmm. out where you lie. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, you, absolutely, you can have short, medium and long-term financial goals. But I do think having an idea of... Uh, realism, which is yeah. what speaking to a professional can provide you. You know, you might say, well, I've, I've got £10,000. I'd like a million. Sadly, it's my job to tell you that over, say, a five-year time horizon, that's quite unlikely. Um, but, you know, that's where you can get help. If you know what position you're starting from and what you're aiming towards, whether it is, you know, can I afford to spend X every year on expensive handbags and yeah. still retire when I want to? 
Well, those are the sorts of discussions you can have with advisors yeah. um, and they can really help you plan. For me, that's, that's really important and quite critical in the mindset because it's that perception versus the reality. And, you know, when I consider what I do for business, it's working with clients on their reality and looking to help them unlock and challenge their perceptions that they can then create a reality and an outcome that works for them. And what you're suggesting is you do the same with your financial well-being because it's a mindset. So if, if I were to embrace that with you and Rafa, then what could that sort of customer journey look like? Mm. Well, this is a really good question because I can talk to both a rougher client journey but also just more generally in financial services. Um, I think the first thing to say is that you should know or if you're having a discussion with someone in the financial services industry about whether or not you might use their services, that should be a no obligation, no fee exchange. Mm. So uh, if it isn't, I would that was an alarm bell. So there's no there's no danger, there's no negative to reaching out and having a conversation, is what I'm saying in the first instance. Um, from a rougher perspective, we would have that meeting with you, discuss what your situation is and what your goals are. Um, I said we're, we're slightly different, and we are different in that we only have one investment strategy. Um, we focus on not losing money, capital preservation, which means that if you are looking for something very high octane, high risk, and you want to chase markets, we're not for you, and we'll tell you that. But if you are looking for something a bit more risk averse, we might well be well suited to you. So I think that um, that's a differentiator for us in many ways, because when you go and speak to other advisors or managers, they might have lots of different solutions that they can propose to you. Um, and they will probably ask you to do a, a risk survey. So that will ask you a series of questions to gauge how, how much are you willing to lose? Uh, what's your capacity for loss? And also, um, how much volatility are you willing to sit through in terms of the returns? Are you happy with plus 30 one year and plus 20 the next, minus 20 the next, sorry? Those sorts of questions. Um, so that's just to give you an idea of the sort, what the interactions might look like before you decide, yes, I want to go with this person or not. Um, but it's certainly something at Ruffer that we, we actually are pride ourselves on not doing because we think that it should be the job of the fund manager to do the risk management for you rather than uh, saying to clients how much risk would you like us to take on your behalf okay we'll go and do that and if we lose it sorry <laughs> but anyway that's that's me putting my rougher hat back on so I'm very conscious of now taking it back off that's fine back we can we can take it off <laughs> we can put it on we know what we're here to talk about but kind of central to the theme is having agency and confidence yes. and as you say being confident and conscious in the knowledge that no question is a stupid question, that actually more minds around the table provide for a more colourful contribution and, and hopefully process that helps us be more financially literate and in control. But most importantly, that we feel like we have that agency. And yeah. so again, for advice for people here today, what steps do you think they could take to start that process? What questions would you be asking of them? Um, I think I would start, well, if I may, just something I, I, as you were speaking there that I thought of and I really wanted to share. I know personally from experience and also from speaking to my colleagues who are here today, Sabine, Lucy and Emma, that you will see later um, at the workshop, <laughs> which is the first thing you should do if you are thinking of doing more on these topics is go to the rougher workshop because the three of them will be here to act, exactly do that, answer any questions you have, but also help you get a bit of an in to, so that you know how to start that conversation if indeed you go away from today thinking that you're going to be more proactive. Um, but the point I wanted to, to, to make when you were talking about it is I know from speaking to Sabine, Lucy and Emma and, and my own experience that often when women do uh, come to the investment meetings and ask questions, they're quite often asked the hardest questions. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so I think that, yeah. that should give you confidence as well. The coming at things from a different angle, maybe less focused on the detail and asking big picture questions about, well, why are you allocating capital that way? Or well, why would that work over the long term? Those questions are hard to answer. Um, and they think them as usual. Yes, yes, exactly, Sabine. And often we find clients think they're, oh, I'm sorry, I'm asking a stupid question. You're not. You're absolutely not. So I think have that confidence from the get-go 
Um, I'm not just saying there's no stupid questions because I'm paid to be nice to you either way. Mm. I'm saying it because in my experience, women are much better on average at thinking over the longer term and focusing on what is the outcome I'm trying to get and is this going to get me where I'm going? Um, in the end, you know, I can tell you whatever you want to know about a bond or about an equity, an equity share. That's my job, but that's not, that's not the relevant thing. Sure. to the relationship. So on the subject of questions, I'd like to open it up to the audience because I think we have a few questions. I'm sure there are lots of questions, many for the workshop, but if I can go over to the lady with her hand up on the left, my left first. <coughs> that was what are the top three questions we should be asking a fund manager. If you're looking for a fund manager, did you say? Okay. I think linked to what the discussion we've had already this morning, I would be asking, um, how, how are your incentives aligned to my objectives? I think that's always a very important question and the answer is very telling because you want to ensure that whoever is managing your money mm. has some sort of incentive aligned with you. So uh, this is sort of referred to as skin in the game or um, you know, just understanding how they're rewarded is important. I think a second one clearly is around, well, what are you going to charge? What are your fees? And it's a, a big topic in, in wealth management over the last few years, and there's been regulation as well around it. But, you know, the second question linked to that that's very important is, are you going to charge me a fee, but then also give my money to other people who also charge a fee? I think that's a very important question to ask. And then lastly, again, keeping high level is, how are you... How, how are you going to help me achieve my goal? And do you have a track record of having mm -hmm. achieved this in the past? I think that those, those are three really good starter questions to get you going. Thank you. I think we had another question. Yes. I, I was going to ask you that question. What, what is your track record? At Ruffer? Yeah. So at Ruffer, we've been going for nearly 30 years following a single strategy, and we have returned around 8% net of fees annualised over that time. Congratulations. Do we have any other question? I think there was another. Yes, can I take a question? Or you can shout it out if it's. Hello. Um, uh, I run my own business. I'm sure a lot of other people in here do as well. <clears throat> um, I'm guessing the answer is as much as possible, but is there such a thing as a, a target or a minimum percentage of annual income that you should be setting aside for retirement? That's a biggie. Yeah, um, I think as much as possible is the answer. If I can take the easy out on that. I mean, you, you, I know you have to be realistic. Um, it's, and sometimes it's not static. If particularly if, say, you have your own business and there's a period of you know, capital intensity where you're putting money into the business, maybe it's not feasible to save at the same time. I think what's important is that you remain diligent about when that stops being the case. I think it's very easy if you stop saving to suddenly it's been four or five months before you've thought about it and you've just been living a slightly better quality of, you know, just been spending a little bit more. So I, big caveat around, you know, every month I would be sitting down with a spreadsheet and saying, can I save a hundred pounds? Because even just pound cost averaging a hundred pounds into whatever it is every month is going to be beneficial over the long term. That's some very specific advice. One more question that you're looking for? Minimum investment. Is there a minimum for Ruffer, investment for, for Ruffer? Ruffer? It's 500,000 for Ruffer. Okay, great. That was a nice, simple, easy one. But you, yes. So you can. Come and speak to Lucy, Sabine and Emma. Come, I so think that's an invitation. Our, it is an invitation. So our funds are available on most platforms. So AJ Bell, Hargreaves, Lansdowne, etc. So you could buy one share for £2.80 or something if you wanted to. Um, but yeah, 500,000 pounds minimum for in-house. Well, I'm conscious of keeping Sarah on time. So to kind of wrap this up, thank you, um, Fiona. I think for me, the key outtakes are going back to the notion of knowing your worth and self-worth and value. It's having the, the courage 
to take some control and take a stake because that control will pay dividends in your own self-esteem. Because for all of the neuroscientists in the room, and I know there's a few of them here, our brains don't like not feeling in control. Yes. And that is the founding principle to us feeling like we are whole, we are true to ourself, and we have a plan. And I think there's some key outcomes and many, many more that will be discussed in your workshop this afternoon. But hopefully it's triggered some thoughts on what are you doing about your own relationship with money, your own ability to drive and have control in your financial future. And those tiny steps are not about being an expert in the field or having the, the kind of the, the beauty of a, of a partner who is, but actually taking some stake in the conversation at whatever level and taking action. So with that, thank you, Fiona, and welcome to the workshop. <laughs> <laughs>